jumping, nipping, barking, out of control. Boy, everybody's miserable. <laughs> you know, you could punish bad behavior. Um, and actually, that can reduce it. But you could teach men's and women's best friend to fear you. And, well, that's not the object of the game when we have a pet, is it? So what I'd rather do is teach them to work for rewards. And if I were a dog, I guess that's what I'd like to do. That would be my preference. So, um, anybody here hire a trainer or take their dog to obedience class? And do you have experience with punishment or reward-based training? This is really much more about training, this little meeting, than it is about behavior disorders. Although I have a story for you as usual, and there's sort of a mix of both in this case. And uh, I think it, it, it illustrates some great points because the dog did real well, and he started out really, really rough around the edges. So we'll get to that in just a minute. And in case we haven't met, I'm veterinarian Dr. Jeff Nickel, and um, Gaston here. Gaston, would you like to be in my lap? He's sitting in his mama's lap. Carolyn will pass him to me in just a minute. Um, anyway, uh, uh, of course we, as everybody I'm sure knows who's hanging with us, we, our dog passed away a couple of months ago and we're nowhere near ready for another dog. But we visited with three Border Collie puppies earlier this week, adult dogs really, and they were just absolutely delightful. Um, they belong to a, a mighty good dog trainer here in Albuquerque who also shows them in the confirmation ring. And um, they, uh, it was just very sweet. And we're, uh, we're very partial to Border Collies and I'm sure that's the direction we're gonna take. We just don't have any idea when. And Misty, thank you for coming and thank Portia's you for letting me know. Who else is here? Portia. Oh, Portia's here. Oh, wonderful, I didn't see there, her name yet. She was on there when I first. Uh, oh, there we go. Well, Portia, hey, excellent. Um, just got together and helped Portia with their dog. Um, so thank you for coming again. And Misty, and here's Tony. Tony, by the way, was at the veterinary hospital with me today. Tony um, is almost 15. And, um, you know, he's been an occasional vomiter most of his life. Um, and recently his appetite kind of comes and goes. Um, and he's been very, very slowly losing weight um, and getting a little skinnier. And I've had Dr. Ann Hale, our internal medicine specialist at the Veterinary Emergency and Specialty Center, um, work with me and, and help me with him. And so we got x-rays of his abdomen today and an ultrasound of his abdomen. And it turns out he has a benign tumor on one of his bile ducts. And these, you know, they're not malignant, but they, um, they can cause problem with bile flow and lead to nausea and vomiting and poor appetite. Uh, we don't know for sure if that's what his problem is, but we're going to start treating with a medication to reduce vomiting. Thank you for that, Hart. And to improve his appetite, and we hope to get a little weight on this joker. Uh, we'll do whatever it takes, of course, because they're pretty special to us, you know. <laughs> um, anyway, so, um, uh, anybody here have a trainer? I wanted to also, oh, Martha, hello, thank you for coming. Um, uh, I've got a story about about a dog who had been to a trainer and actually the trainer had gotten the dog off to a good start. One of the disconnects can be with, if you can hear the thunder here, got a little, you know, thunderstorm in the desert, we like that. Um, but dog trainers are mighty important. You know, many times you can hire a trainer to come to your home and uh, help you get your dog started. Some dog trainers do board and train where you leave the dog with them for a couple of weeks and they do the training. The only misgiving I have with that sometimes is that, you know, the dog can learn to work well for the trainer, but who's the dog's leader? Well, it's you, of course, and you're the one who really needs to teach the dog so you develop that rapport. And you can do it under the guidance of a good trainer, or you can go to an obedience training class, which works very well in a lot of cases. Um, but these folks, Judith and Norman, have these two Weimaraners. Let me show you a picture. Here's a picture of Aldo, see that guy? Very handsome, isn't he? Um, the other dog, a little older than Aldo, his name is Leopold. So you know, the Aldo Leopold wilderness. Well, um, Aldo, really sweet dog, but here were the presenting complaints. These are the reason that they brought him in to me for behavior treatment. 
biting people, biting other dogs, reactive toward other dogs when on leash walks, and barking at other dogs and humans in almost any situation. Now, those are not pleasant behaviors, and these folks did not like those. And, you know, again, the trainer that they hired did not advocate punishment. But you can see how easy it would be to get frustrated with that kind of thing and jerk on a prong collar, for example, or even use an electric shock collar. And there's nothing unusual about that among some trainers. Um, I don't want to get on a diatribe about that, but we don't uh, recommend that. So we first, uh, I go out in the parking lot and I meet folks, and then I invite them into the exam room. Well, as soon, actually he was, this was before the epidemic, so these folks were out in the waiting room. And I always emerge very quietly because I don't want to startle people's pets. I'm not helping them if I do that. So I go out there, you know, don't look directly at the dog and, you know, just quietly say hello and invite them in. But as soon as I quietly opened the door and before I even opened my mouth, um, Aldo barked at me. I mean, he startled just by seeing me, which I don't think I'm that scary looking. Maybe, I don't know. Anyway, he barked at everybody as soon as he saw them because pretty much everything scared this poor dog. So, um, you know, they let him in. We put him on the scale to get his weight, and he was a nervous little guy. Um, and finally, after about 30 minutes in the exam room of pacing and, and scanning, looking back and forth, looking for some other shoe to fall, um, he finally came over and sniffed me. I just, without looking at him, moved very slowly, lower my hand next to my chair, let him come over and sniff and investigate, which is what, that's normal canine behavior. And, well, we want to promote that. So um, this guy, Aldo, he'd been adopted from a private home at about 12 weeks of age. I guess it wasn't the best of homes, but, you know, at 12 weeks, most of the behaviors that these folks started with with this dog are clearly were genetic in origin, not environmental. In other words, not because of mistakes they'd made. And that's, frankly, nearly always the case. So um, they found that he was startled by any stranger. And when he saw one, his tendency was to run up at them, bark at them, and nip at them. And he had bitten people. Um, and why was he doing this? Well, you know, you'll hear people say, oh, he's trying to dominate people. That is exceptionally rare. Some dogs have offensive aggression. That's pretty unusual. More commonly, especially when somebody comes in the house, and the dog suddenly, you know, somebody appears at the door when it opens, and there's this sudden appearance of this alien, many dogs are startled. Part of their reaction is territorial behavior, which is normal enough, of course, but they get startled. Well, if they're afraid, what they would love to do would take off and run the other way and create distance. Well, if the dog's inside a house, he's completely confined by the walls, and as much as dogs are pets, they belong with us, but they are, um, uh, you know, they're really actually programmed to function in the wild where there are no obstructions like walls where they can create all the distance they want. So a dog who's anxious and scared like Aldo, that poor guy cannot adapt. And what he has learned is that by mounting an aggressive display, the scary monster usually creates distance and he feels better. So because he feels better each time he, you know, makes a big old aggressive uh, display of things becomes a self-rewarding behavior because every time he does it, finally the scary monster goes further away. I mean, it always works like that, doesn't it? So we, um, we had a dog here who was reacting inappropriately. Now, there were lots of things about this dog's history that made it clear that he was anxious. So let me continue with this. Um, when, he, uh, uh, when they would have him on a trail, on a, on a walk, but on a trail in the mountains, and he uh, and a jogger uh, would go past on a narrow trail. He always tried to nip and, in fact, did bite one person in that context. Um, but when people were farther away, he did not show aggression, especially when in outdoors when he wasn't suddenly surprised, like he was when I opened the door into the reception room at the veterinary hospital. Um, and, in fact, he did the same thing with other dogs. And, in fact, with other dogs and in one case of a person, as they went past him, he turned around and bite him on the rear end. Now, that could be kind of funny in a YouTube video if it's not your rear end. So why would a dog bite somebody in the rear end? Well, I'll tell you why. If they're looking at the person or the other dog and they're intimidated, 
and they're not going to make a quick move. And then that scary monster goes past them, and now we no longer have the eyeball to eyeball. We no longer have that pretty intense intimidation of this really badly frightened dog. The creature, the person, the other dog is going the other way, but they're still agitated, and they want them to get the heck out of the way and create distance ASAP, so they bite them on the rear end. This is a clear sign of fear. Now, fear and anxiety, of course, are not the same thing. But if you have a dog who, in an unusual situation, is nervous, anxious, what's going to happen next? What might be lurking around that next corner? It doesn't take a whole lot of additional stimulus, a startle, for example, to ratchet that dog over his threshold for loss of impulse control and react out of fear. Well, defensive aggression goes along with fear for many dogs. Not all of them. Some dogs tremble and hide, but others do become defensive aggressive, in part because they feel it's self-preservation. People think, oh, that's ridiculous. I have no intention to hurt some dog. Why would it react defensively towards me? You know, dog lovers, our intentions are good, aren't they? Well, the truth is, though, that doesn't mean that the dog understands that. And again, if the dog is frightened, then um, why would the dog have a logical thought in his head? And they don't. So, um, one case, these folks had an interior designer come. And, you know, they had an appointed time. Um, well, she didn't knock. She just opened the front door and she shouted, I'm here. And Aldo was in the other room and immediately startled and ran at her and uh, bit her on the leg. Uh, right through her jeans. Did not create a penetrating wound, but a pretty generous bruise. Oh, Julia, you're here. Oh, aren't you nice? The, a Malinois in Florida. I, I, you know, I hope you're doing fine. And Scott's doing fine up there, too, in Santa Fe. And Isabella, thank you for coming from Europe. Gee, isn't social media amazing, isn't it? Um, Gaston, would you like to sit in my lap? Oh, he's right here. He well, you know, I... didn't want in mine just well, now, but he looks Yeah, he's pretty fussy, and I think it's because he was at the hospital today, because oh, okay. I pet him, and he kind of does this with his paw. He's yeah. not particularly happy about this. Well, visitors and unfamiliar people and other dogs were not the only recipients of Aldo's bad behavior. When his people, and I can tell you I observed him with them, and it's very clear that they have a healthy relationship with their dog, the nervous wreck that he is. And so they'd be out together and they'd come home, they're both retired, and when they walked in the door, Aldo would get so highly aroused that he'd be jumping all over the place and take a nip at their abdomen and he'd bitten their clothing. Now, is this dog trying to hurt his leaders? Uh, I can assure you that from the exhaustive history and observations and exam and interaction that I had with him, that wasn't the case at all. He just got so highly aroused, he didn't know what else to do with himself, and he's a young guy, and he's real mouthy. Now, why do some dogs do that? He wasn't aggression in the case of his own people, Judith and Norman, and it certainly was not uh, an intention to drive them farther away, because his behavior was very different when they walked in the door. You know, tail up, ears forward, delighted to see them, but out of control. And what else could he do? Well, if he didn't have enough exposure to other puppies and adult dogs when he was in his sensitive period, his socialization period, which in dogs, that developmental, quickly changing stage of brain growth between age 7 to 12 weeks, that's when they should be exposed to all manner of gentle creatures, big dogs, little dogs, young dogs, adult dogs, Big people, little people, men, women, people of different races, cats, the whole thing. And they can accept them. Even if they're genetically fearful, they can learn that, hey, all these different kinds of creatures that I was exposed to during my sensitive period, they're okay, and they retain that memory for life. But once that window of socialization is closed at about 12 weeks, it's mighty hard to you know, teach them that these other things are okay. We can do it, but it's a very big challenge. So here was Aldo, and he missed out on that social contact with other puppies, where they actually teach each other boundaries and appropriate behavior. And you know, if you've ever seen puppies playing and they roughhouse and they, and they open their mouth and they mouth each other, and every once in a while somebody cries and goes after the other guy, well, they're, 
They're teaching each other appropriate social interactions. But here's Aldo, the other dog in the home, much older and very calm dog. So Aldo just took out all that puppy wild nonsense on his people. Well, that's not appropriate. Now, when he was not highly aroused, he was content to be, you know, pretty good. But when he got aroused, he lost control of himself. Do you punish that? Well, if you did, you know, punishment, it's not a four-letter word in learning theory. It really has a place, but you've got to be so careful and only use it for a small amount of your teaching. And in many cases, you don't need it at all. And it isn't necessarily harmful. You have to apply it immediately following the undesirable or bad behavior. It's got to be strong enough. doesn't mean that, you know, you bring a dog to a near-death experience, but it's got to get the message across. And it has to occur consistently every single time that behavior occurs. So every time Judith and Norman arrived home, they could jerk, you know, if this dog were dragging a leash from a choke or a prong collar, they could jerk that, okay? And they do it consistently every time. That dog would learn to stop doing it. But who's meeting out that pain? His trusted leaders. They don't want that. What kind of relationship does that build? Well, I, you know, I don't have to tell you. So we're not going to do that, okay? So we, I had to explain to them that Aldo was struggling with a pretty severe anxiety disorder because he was often in unusual situations scanning um, and so looking for the other shoe to fall. And this was likely genetic. Carolyn, if you would pass me Gaston, you know, he might sit in my lap. I would like that. He's over here. He's just camped out. You know how cats are. They might sit with you or they might not. Um, yeah, there he is. Anyway, so um, how can we set him up for success? These people like to have friends over. And every time, you know, somebody showed up at the door and they opened the door, old Aldo, potentially dangerous. So I said, look, do this. Set him up for success. Put him in the other room before you expect your friends to arrive and wait until everybody is seated and settled. And when they're seated, they appear much smaller, so they're less of a perceived threat. And they're not mobile. They're not walking around. So after they've been seated and settled and everybody's had a glass of tea or whatever, then you let Aldo out and people should ignore him. And if people are not going to follow instructions, then you leave him in the other room until they go. But if yeah, they can be trusted to follow instructions, then they can um, uh, be allowed to come out and uh, say hello to people. So that's what they did with Aldo. Now the problem, of course, sometimes is that a, you know, an alien creature, a visitor, uh, stands up and that startles the dog and you know, he starts barking and raising a ruckus and rehearsing these, these uh, inappropriate ramp ups, these neural circuits in his brain that we actually need him to abandon. So, you know, we, we, we have to take this very, very slowly. And, you know, people, again, very often guests love dogs and they feel like they have a special rapport and they want to help bring out the best in the dog when, in fact, uh, that's not what happens. So <laughs> take it super slow. Um, so that made a big difference for him. Um, I also told him, look, he doesn't have to be exposed to guests. You could simply leave him and the other dog out in the yard during the duration of visitors being in the house. So. Um, no big deal. Didn't have to do that. Didn't have to inadvertently set Aldo up to panic and bite people. And frankly, that's what some people do to train their dogs to stop a behavior they don't want. It, they're actually setting the dog up to make the mistake and they're ready and willing to jerk hard or apply electric shock and yell at the dog to make it stop that behavior when in fact it's driven by fear. Well, does it make any sense to punish fear? Uh, no. It, in case anybody's wondering, it, it, it does not. Um, and uh, so let's see here. I had another question. Maybe not. Um, I need a national platform. Well, you're right about that, Julia, and I'm working on that, darn it. Um, come September, late September, we're going to be doing some of these over at the Animal Humane New Mexico facility and uh, talking about behaviors with dogs and cats there. So they've got a bigger platform, and yeah, I, I would, if you have connections, Julia, I would love it because I'd like to share useful information on pets so people don't cause more trouble and they get good results. So anyway, um, what else could help this dog? Well, 
He had, he's a young guy, about a year old, and he had an enormous amount of unspent energy, and uh, he's a big fella, you know? And Weimaraners, of course, are hound dogs, and they have lots and lots of needs for running and playing hard. So I said, we need to get this dog a consistent, every single day, strenuous, sustained physical exertion. Maybe you've heard the expression that a tired dog is a happy dog. Well, that's absolutely the case. And the reason is that the neurotransmitter serotonin, produced largely in the brain, reduces anxiety. And it's also produced and released by the skeletal muscles, the muscles of the limbs. So they have found in human studies, as well as in dogs, that if we give consistent daily exercise, there's measurably less anxiety. And so a dog like Aldo, he needed to run and play hard every single day. So I encourage them to take him to a doggy daycare or to a dog park. Uh, you know, you can get involved in dog sports like agility or fly ball, um, you know, scent work, what they call nose work. They have competitions for that stuff. Um, things that are, are particular to the breed of dog, the type of dog. So in this case, a hound dog, something that involves scent could be right up his alley. Um, he has big needs, and we need to try to manage them in ways that are as close to his natural state as possible. Okay, So, uh, avoidance of arousal triggers too. But safety had to be important. And so, here was an important thing about this. And this, I tell many people to memorize this little rule. And Carolyn, maybe you'll remind me, I'll put this into the, into the Facebook after we're done with this is that dogs who are reactive when somebody approaches them or leans over or reaches for them, and part of it is staring eyeball to eyeball with the dog, that's a fear response. And if you have a dog who has ever reacted to the approach of someone, especially someone unfamiliar, or reaching over or leaning, and frankly, veterinarians and their staff make this mistake too, um, don't do that stuff. A dog is saying, holy smoke, how the heck do I get out of this situation? I have no escape. And so they react aggressively, very often driven largely by fear. So you can take a dog like Aldo, who was frightened of unfamiliar people, like veterinarians, and instead of approaching him and leaning over him and trying to pet him and soothe him and then do a physical exam or give a vaccination or whatever is necessary, you lure the dog to come to you. Or in cases where they won't come, what I like to do is squat down several feet from the dog with my back to the dog, and I'm squatting. And I have its person walk the dog up next to my side. So the dog is coming up next to my side. I'm facing this way. The dog's facing this way. And its person is facing this way. The dog is between us. And when its person, its leader, its owner, if you will, squats down on that side of the dog, now we have a dog between our hips, shoulder to shoulder to shoulder no sense of confrontation. I, I'm small, its person is small, and I'm examining and working with the dog from the side. And so what we've got to do is find strategies that avoid this dog's fear triggers. And we don't mistakenly set them up for failure and then punish that. So if you're looking for a trainer, it's best to ask, you can say, what kind of training do you do? Do you do just reward-based training or do you use punishment, or if you do, how do you do it? You can ask those questions. My suggestion, though, is to present a hypothetical, including maybe what your dog is doing, and just say, my dog barks like a fiend when this happens. How do you like to manage that? And if they talk about jerking on the prong collar or using an electric shock, and many times they minimize the importance of that. They'll say, oh, you know, we use a low voltage, so it's just a little reminder, you know, uh, no. Because we're, even if it's not any more painful than static electricity, we are punishing, in many cases, fear. And I, you don't have to be a credentialed veterinary behaviorist to know that that doesn't make any sense. I hope you don't have to, you know. Anyway, so um, what about his exuberance when, when they came home? I mean, you can't let that continue to happen. You know, he's biting at their abdomen for crying out loud. He's losing control of himself. So I told them that before leaving home, 
in fact, at all times that he's indoors, they can do this. They have Aldo dragging a six-foot leash from his collar. Not a choke or a prong collar, just a regular flat collar, and not a harness. Those things, frankly, don't work very well. So he's dragging a six-foot leash from his collar, and they walk in the door, and they know that he's going to be exuberant. And we know, and if you've, if you've been to these little Facebook lives before, you've learned this, that dogs regard any response from a person, any person can be a leader, they regard anything that comes from us as a validation of their behavior and of their emotional state of the moment. So if the dog is in some inappropriate emotional state, behaving badly, um, and you uh, respond in any way at all, tell Aldo he's a good boy, tell him he's a horrible dog, yell at him, he regards that as an earned validation for his behavior of the moment and his emotional state of the moment, which is why the old saying that all parenting books have, all leadership books for business is, if you have children or employees, catch them doing something right. Well, that's because humans are operant learners, which is largely trial and error. If I get what I want for doing this behavior, I'm going to repeat this behavior. And if I don't get what I want, then I'm going to stop doing it. Right? It's like going to a job with a paycheck versus going to a job without a paycheck. Well, dogs regard any response from a person as a paycheck, any response. So when Judith and Norman came home, they needed to completely ignore, not ignore Aldo. They're such good ignorers, there isn't such a thing, okay? They just walk in. But what is on the floor is that drag line, that leash that Aldo is dragging from his collar. So first thing they do while ignoring is step on the drag line, okay? And if they move their feet just a little bit at a time towards the end of the leash that's attached to a dog collar, which it would be around a dog's neck if there were a dog, but we're ignoring, so there isn't. And they can stand on that leash. And if they feel the leash pulling beneath their shoe, they know that if they had a dog, which they don't because they're ignoring, that he would be trying to jump up because they can feel the leash under their shoe. And so they ignore until they don't feel the leash pulling under their shoe. And then they very quietly say, good boy, Aldo. The reason that they reinforce so quietly is because the dog will follow their emotional lead. They are the leaders. So if they're relaxed, then the dog goes, me too. Okay? So um, repeat hundreds of times. All right? So what they're doing is actually, rather than setting the dog up for failure, which without meaning to, they're doing that just by walking in the door. Thank you for those hearts. I hope this is helpful. Really, if you have a dog that behaves badly when you arrive home, then your arrival home is setting a dog up for failure. Well, you're going to keep coming home, aren't you? So let's do something different. Let's prevent the dog from doing the wrong thing, give it an opportunity to the, do the right thing, and in the case of a dog who's overly exuberant when you arrive home, the wrong thing is jumping up, but the wrong thing, I'm sorry, the right thing is having all feet on the floor. He doesn't have to be totally zen, just a moderate improvement in his wild exuberance should be reinforced quietly. Because if you wait until you get exactly what you want, you just don't have enough opportunities to reinforce and you cannot shape the behavior that you need and you're making it extremely hard for the dog to learn. So we want to set these guys up for success, not failure, and we want to make it as easy as possible for them to learn with a very simple message, and that is that if I'm, I'm trying to jump up, but I can't because somebody's standing on the leash, and I, uh, then I stop that nonsense because I've calmed down a little, that earns a reinforcer. And if the leader is consistent, then what I've learned is that one job doesn't pay. That's the one of jumping up and being exuberant. There's no paycheck. But having all feet on the floor and being even a little calmer, that always pays. And then the leader will stand there again if, if I start jumping up and down and ignore. And then when I stop that, I'm a good dog again. And then finally, you know, you take your foot off the leash and very quietly, you lead the dog into the other room. You can give it a simple command, another opportunity to earn a verbal reinforcer, maybe a little tidbit from your treat bag, a little gentle petting, repeat hundreds of times, okay? So, and I, the, the final point that I made for them that I really wanted them to learn was something called um, earned privileges. 
Some people call that nothing in life is free. Well, um, there are two things that are free for a dog that they do not consider scarce resources. One of those things is air to breathe, the other is water to drink. They do not have to ask Mother May I to get those things. And we're talking about how they function as a member of a social group, free living in the wild with a male or female leader whose principal responsibility is try to keep everybody alive because nature isn't always kind and sometimes there are members of the group who don't make it. And the second priority is passing on their genetic code. Now there are others, but those are by far the big ones. Okay, so the mother dog, or I'm sorry, the lead dog, male or female, um, <clears throat> she practices what we call in behavior parlance earned privileges or differential reinforcement, meaning that if you don't like a behavior, the lead dog ignores it, which is a big consequence because the subordinates aren't sure they're going to make it if they don't get behavioral cues and opportunities to pull together with the group. It's a huge consequence and lead dogs are real good ignorers. And then the other half of differential reinforcement is that catch them doing something right thing. When the lead dog says, that's good behavior, you are now allowed to eat. You are now allowed to play. You are now allowed to leave the territory and sniff and investigate. You're allowed to go with the group on the hunting expedition. You are allowed to just have an interaction with me, the, the great leader. All those things are privileges. And it's so hard for most of us to think of that. We, we love our pets like they were little children in furry suits, and that's a good thing. But we forget they're members of a different species, and some of the rules are different. So in this, a dog like Aldo, who's anxious and having a hard time adapting, he needs a structure that is innately genetically programmed into that little brain of his, and that is that if I earn things, I can have the resources I need. So what Judith and, and Norman, primarily Norman, what he did with Aldo was that when he, uh, when Aldo wanted to go out, made him sit, wait a few seconds, okay, Aldo, you can go out. Time to feed, down, or whatever, you know, jump through a hula hoop, silly tricks, doesn't matter, okay? Dog has to perform for everything, including a kind word and a pat on the head, and you think, my dog has to work for that? That's the way they think. And if you have a well-adjusted, adaptable dog who doesn't have a behavior disorder, ah, the dog knows that you don't understand, but they work with us anyway, okay? But if you have an anxious dog, you need to provide a structure that they understand. And so for Aldo, everything he wanted, he had to earn for it, earn it. And he and Norman became, well, they bonded over it, and they had great fun with it. And so Aldo, every time he wanted something, he would look to his leader and watch and wait. Okay, what's he going to tell me this time? Which of my skills will I need to show him and perform? And I get what I want. And that brings out the best. That's a happy dog who gets to work for what he wants because that's the way he thinks. And so now we've set this dog up to get what he wants, and that's reward-based training. And not just the training to earn the privileges, but every time it's implemented by Norman, this dog is getting rewarded for looking to his leader, which is normal for dogs. Wow, hey, eh? you can do this. And you know, I encourage people to do that, whether you've got a well-behaved dog or, a, or one that has a problem. Um, exercise, really important. And if you're gonna do any training for your dog, I don't care whether you're going to an obedience class or whether you're having a dog trainer come to your house, exercise that dog good and heavy before you start that stuff because you just lower the agitation, the arousal, even if it's a normal dog, you've got a dog who is calmer and now capable of focusing and learning, okay? Exercise is a good thing, but the timing of it can really matter. So if you find this helpful, um, or like Julia, if you want to pass this information on to other people, I appreciate it very much, you can encourage people to subscribe to my website, drjeffnickel.com, D-R, Jeff, N-I-C, hol.com and at the bottom of the home page you can subscribe put your email address in there thank you for the hearts and um, cost nothing and every Tuesday morning in your email box you will get my weekly Facebook live video and my weekly media blog um, which I think I hope provides useful information um, and uh, and when you do sign up by the way I'll send you at no charge my at-home pet first aid and CPR guide which Keep those handy. 
It can be a lifesaver. So, American Veterinary Society of Animal Behavior. Um, it's one of the professional organizations that I belong to. It's, it's a group of, um, uh, wait a minute, I want to show you this. There we go. Uh, veterinarians. Uh, many of us are credentialed specialists in behavior medicine, uh, but any veterinarian can, uh, can join. And um, uh, we have position statements on, on a growing number of subjects now, and this one is called a position statement on humane dog training. And I will put a link to this in my Facebook page, uh, and you can read it. It's not very long. It is uh, completely referenced with very robust and sound research, peer-reviewed. Just a couple of points in here I wanted to, to run past you. Research supports the eff efficacy of reward-based training to address unwanted and challenging behaviors. There is no evidence that aversive training is necessary for dog training or for behavior modification. Training methods are most effective when they focus on teaching the pet what to do rather than punishing them for unwanted behaviors. Okay? And it, goes into much greater detail here. Here's another brief one I'll read to you. Multiple surveys have shown that higher, have shown higher obedience in dogs trained with reward-based training. In other words, if you want to be effective, you use reward-based training. Um, obedience levels, uh, blah, 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 blah. Dogs trained with a combination, and this is what some trainers will suggest that they do. And let me tell you a little bit about this. Trained with a combination of rewards uh, and aversive-based methods, often referred to as balanced training, produced lower obedience levels than reward-based, but better than exclusively averse-based. So in other words, the more uh, positive reinforcement you use, the better your dog's going to learn. Um, this balanced thing where they say, okay, we use rewards, and we, they might not use the term punishment. They might say something like, you know, we correct them, you know. Well, corrections are okay as far as they go. I mean, you need somebody, if you're going to hire a trainer, who really understands. So somebody who's got, um, like, Karen Pryor Academy credentials, those people know what the heck they're doing. Um, Isabella says, I entirely agree with you on the socialization window. However, what would your advice be when this window has passed? Uh, example, when one adopts or rescues an older dog, is it not sometimes the case that owners project too much fear, anxiety onto a pet instead of exuding confidence and exposing them to the big bad world, as it were. Well, you make some very strong points here, Isabella. Um, you know, that's the beauty of, of that sensitive period, seven to 12 weeks, and it's very strongly supported by research uh, into brain development. Um, and you're absolutely right. You know, people do such great things by adopting adult pets and, you know, People who had the dog when it was a puppy had no idea, right? Um, and so the puppy is not socialized. Well, you can desensitize those, those dogs to their fears. It's a very slow, tedious, repetitive process. Um, and I certainly counsel many people on that and help them put that into motion at home. But they absolutely must avoid intense fear triggers like we did with Aldo. Avoid that stuff. Give him an out. Make it easy for him to succeed. And you know, every one of these cases that we treat in, in a behavior practice like mine, these are, the cases I treat are, they're medical problems because they're disorders of this organ up here, the brain, considered the most complex organ in the body. And there are circuit, circuitry problems and neurochemical disorders, which is a big reason that they are in bad condition. Um, I'm not a trainer. Um, there is a little overlap between behavior medicine and training um, to the extent that we see the results of mistakes made in training. Um, but it, you have to avoid most of the things that trigger significant fear, if not all of them, in a case like an adult dog. And then you need to uh, set them up for success um, at great distances. And sometimes when they've got a severe disorder, medications to reduce anxiety uh, can be a really valuable part of what we do. There are folks who feel like that's the last resort or should never use these things, but they don't understand them. They might think there are risks or that they cause sluggishness. These things, we have to understand what we're doing, and we certainly don't use them in, unless we need to. And there's lots of choices, and we have to understand how they work and when to use which ones. But we use every tool we need to 
to improve life. Uh, not just to improve the bond between the dog and the person, but to improve the quality of the pet's life. And, you know, the quality of the person along with it. Um, uh, it one last point here. Dogs trained using physical punishment were also less likely to interact with their owner during play. We, we, we've damaged the whole point of having a dog. So, um, uh, what else? Anybody else? Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's most of it. Um, anybody have a question? You're welcome to put it on my Facebook page. Um, oh, there's one, there's one right there. Let's see. Thank you, says Isabella. You're welcome. Um, I hope your kitty is feeling better soon. Thank you. Yeah, he's a little bit grouchy tonight. And the white guy is flopped over here on the rug. So I'm sitting with a blanket on my lap and I'm petless. It's not very interesting, is it? Carolyn thinks it's funny. Anyway, I guess it is. Veterinarian with no pet. Um, <laughs> um, so next week, Wednesday, to do one on cats. And I think people who don't have cats, who don't really have an interest in having cats, I don't, well, I have cats, and I'll always have cats. But even if you're really not into cats, I suggest you visit uh, anyway, because some of the principles are the same. And we're going to talk about cats who are aggressive towards visitors, visiting dogs and visiting people. And that can be a big problem. Cats, you know, 8, 10, 12 pounds, they can be dangerous. And you're welcome, Portia. <laughs> um, and so what do we do with them? Uh, you know, most people don't bother trying to punish cats. That really goes in the wrong direction. Uh, they don't mind, uh, you know, dishing it back out again. And boy, that really destroys relationships too. And there's a way to bring out their best. So on that note, gentlemen, I've got two cats on the floor here right in front of me and nobody's in my lap. Gaston, they're acting like I'm invisible. So um, take the time to build a foundation of trust and choice and freedom for your pets before asking them to do things differently for you. This is a process and that foundation matters because if, if you, dogs and cats are a lot like people. If their leader only wants their needs met, they can become obstinate and nobody's going anywhere. Well, I'll tell you something that they can learn anytime during a relationship that they can trust us not to intimidate them. So if you've made mistakes or you've mistakenly hired a trainer who's inflicted aversive punishment and caused trouble, we can undo most of that. We can rebuild from there. And it, uh, a, a great, a great friend and colleague of mine, she's a dog trainer, used to be in Albuquerque, helped me with a lot of my cases, Joy Ford. She commented when she saw me promote this Facebook Live, she goes, this is so important. She's working with a dog right now. She works up in Colorado. And this dog uh, has been to a trainer who did some damage. And it's a process, but I have faith in her and I think she can undo it. Um, so your pets will forgive you. That's okay. And we can move on from there. Um, and if you'd like a, a consultation, you can, you can go to my website and learn about that. I've also got groups that we're doing every Wednesday, or almost every Wednesday at 4 o'clock. You can register on the website, um, be part of a group of four pet parents, and um, it's much less expensive, and I can share a lot of information and help people that way. So um, thank you for sharing this time with me. I'm just delighted to do this, and um, I'm looking forward to doing these with Animal Humane because there's a lot of great things going on over there. So uh, thank you again. And Carolyn, would you hand me that cat, please? I, you know, he's just, I mean, he's, he's a naughty boy. Come over here, Tony T. Tony, almost 15 years old. There. I love my cats.